tens of thousands of lives lost, millions displaced, over a trillion dollars spent. The costs of the longest U.S. military mission in history are staggering. It all began with the U.S. bombing of al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan, launching what became known as the War on Terror, less than a month after al-Qaeda had attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Now, with the last American and allied forces gone from Afghanistan, and the Taliban that sheltered al-Qaeda back in power, many are asking if this and other anti-terror missions, such as the one in war-torn Mali, are worth it. 20 years after 9-11, is the war on terror a lost cause? Welcome to To The Point. It's a pleasure to welcome our guests. Kristen Hilberg is a freelance journalist who has reported extensively from the Middle East for German and Swiss media. And she says, with the war on terror, the West has created more terror, empowered corrupt autocrats, abandoned like-minded people, and betrayed its own principles. And it's a pleasure to welcome Daniel Gerlach. He's editor-in-chief with the North Africa and Middle East magazine Zenith, or Zenit in German, and his opinion, the war on terror has set a precedent. Now many countries are using it to pursue their own interests. And finally, we're very glad to have Tyson Barker back on the show. He's an American political scientist working with the Berlin think tank DGAP. And he says, with the end of Afghanistan and the war on terror, the U.S. is marking the end of the American unipolar chapter. The question is, what comes next? And let me start by picking up on that point, uh, Tyson. You say the withdrawal marks uh, essentially the end of America's role as the indispensable nation, the world's policeman. Yet, hasn't interventionism, as well as isolationism, been a recurring feature of American policy essentially uh, since the inception of the U.S.? Do you really think interventionism is going to go away? I, well, I think it's we're definitely seeing a major uh, drawback. I mean, the, the theme of restraint has been a constant one in U.S. politics for the past 10 years. It was something that Obama ran on. It was something that Trump ran on. Um, but Biden's decision to really make a final withdrawal from Afghanistan and also his push in Congress to withdraw the authorization of use of military force is really something that's going to constrain U.S. action in the world. And I think that that will be a generational uh, change. Daniel, the mission in Afghanistan, like many anti-terror missions elsewhere, morphed into state building. Was it, in fact, utterly for naught, or would you say it did sow some seeds that could flower in future? No, I think there is a, uh, a generation of uh, young Afghans uh, who haven't lived Taliban rule and who uh, looked for something better, for, for something different, who share values of Europeans and of their you know, generational peers everywhere in the world that are connected to the world. So uh, I find it devastating to hear the narrative that all of Afghanistan was always with the Taliban. It was just like a big illusion to think that it could be any way different. And the West failed because they didn't see that. I think that is part of the story, but the other part of the story, that of course, there is a new generation of people who think differently. Um, if that was worth the investment or worth the cost is another story. Uh, but I think we see that all over the world. Um, you know, the narrative that the Middle East or the, the, the Muslim world is just different and it makes no sense to engage with it because it's always going to weigh the same it was. I don't think that is uh, a true analysis. And we're going to talk a little later about what kind of engagement could be productive. But, uh, Kristen, you say the war on terror created more terror. But if we look at the original aim of U.S. and allied operations in Afghanistan, don't we have to acknowledge that there was some success in crushing al-Qaeda's ability to export terror? Yes, but this was finished in 2002, 2003. So the fact that the U.S. stayed on started to weaken the Taliban uh, ruler, rulers and started to rebuild a country or to export their own model of, you know, centralized presidential democracy. This did not work out. And this is, I think, the big problem why the war on terror, in my opinion, failed, because it was led with the wrong means and with the wrong purposes, you know. 
And we had the wrong allies on the ground, corrupt politicians, warlords that we brought into political positions. And these people didn't have the legitimacy within the people and within the country that we were uh, giving us the illusion. So it's, it's very much about illusions, I think, in Afghanistan. I agree, of course, that you have a young generation of people who want to live in a different way. But the illusion was that we really thought that we could export a democracy model and that we, we could install it with people that we consider our fellow, fellow allies, but they were so corrupt and so engaged in, in, in personal enrichment and in drug business that in the end the people in Afghanistan would opt for the Taliban, some of them at least. I want to dig deeper on the mission, but first I would like for us to look back 20 de two decades to September 11th. It is one of those dates that's absolutely etched into the minds of all those who's experienced experienced it. Unforgettable, both the horror and the expressions of solidarity and determination. September 11, 2001. One of the few who were buried under the rubble of the World Trade Center in New York City and lived was police officer Will Jimeno. September 11 lives with me every single day. Uh, it never goes away for those of us that were there that day. Miraculously, Will Jimeno was pulled from the wreckage alive, though with severe internal and external injuries that have not fully healed. Giving up was never an option for him. So I tell people 20 years later, one of the things that I learned that night is to never give up. You fight till the end. But US President Joe Biden decided enough was enough and completed the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan. This decision about Afghanistan is not just about Afghanistan. It's about ending an era of major military operations to remake other countries. So is this the conclusion of America's war on terror? Tyson, your own opening statement ended with a very similar question to that one. So let me put that one to you as, as well as the question that you posed. What comes next? America first, Cold War with China. Where is the U.S. heading now? I think I, <laughs> all of the above, I would say, in some ways. And, and to be quite honest, we don't know what's going to happen with Afghanistan as well. I mean, as was mentioned, there's a, a generation bulk, a youth boom that has is our digital natives that are globalized. There's urbanization that's going to cause a lot of resistance to Taliban rule and a lot of frankly, probably instability in that country. So we don't know if that era is completely over. We do know that the U.S. large footprint is, is coming to an end. Um, but it's, you know, we were very unclear watching this clip. I was just thinking about what was our mission? What were our aims? And the, the political leaders in the United States weren't clear about the aims. They weren't clear about the discrete aims. Yes, they said that we want to make sure that it doesn't become, Afghanistan doesn't become a haven for Al Qaeda. But then we had people like Laura Bush, great first lady, very well respected, saying we want to give rights to women and girls. So we have these conflicting messages, and some of this has come out in the Afghan papers since. I think in the future, uh, the U.S. is going to be much more clear about how it describes its objectives when it engages with the rest of the world. That will be in great power conflict, and frankly, it's going to be more isolationism with the United States. Let me start with uh, or stay with that first mission uh, that Tyson just mentioned, the, mention, the, the attempt to prevent Afghanistan from remaining a base for terrorist organizations like al-Qaeda. We saw U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in Germany at the Ramstein Air Force Base this week, and he called once again on the new leadership of the Taliban to do exactly that, to prevent their country from becoming a launching pad for terror operations. What do you think, Daniel? Uh, uh, will it become one? Certainly uh, in the attack on August 26 on Kabul airport, we saw that Islamic State does have a foothold in Afghanistan right now. Yeah, and the Tal Taliban, uh, Taliban are recommending themselves as the preferred ally of the international community to fight the so-called Islamic State of Khorasan in, in Afghanistan. Uh, look, I think the, the, the conditions of the war, of a war on terror, are, are very different from what they were 20 years ago. Uh, the, the enemy that's been, that the Western countries have been fighting more or less successfully in the last 10 to 15 years were domestic enemies. These were not some remote terror organizations, bin Laden sitting in a, in, in a cave somewhere, literally in a cave in Afghanistan. These were homegrown 
young people who were inspired by this by this ideology and who committed uh, horrible attacks in France and Spain in the UK also in Germany um, and that is a, a very different enemy that the that the Western countries are facing than they were like 20 years ago and here military means are pretty difficult to apply of course you can go and say like I want to go to the source of inspiration of this uh, the source of legitimacy uh, as they went after the so-called Islamic State in Syria and, and and Iraq which they also declared a war on terror but the challenges are different and I think if uh, the US or the Western militaries had today's military capabilities in 2000 of, 2001, namely drone warfare, probably they would have conducted this war on terror in a very different way. I want to go to that point in just a moment, but I would like to get Kristen first to weigh in on the same uh, question of whether you would expect Afghanistan now to revert to being a base for terrorists. We see the new makeup now of yes, the Taliban that. that. government. It includes a man like Sirajuddin uh, Haqqani, who is a wanted uh, terror operator. So what's your take? But this is not new. I mean, you had warlords in the government, in the Western uh, applied government before. You know, you had people like General uh, Dostum, you know, who, who uh, committed crimes uh, against humanity. So this is not new, but definitely the new government that the Taliban just presented is obviously a, a disappointment from a Western point of view. Uh, ISIS, is the Islamic State, is already there. ISIS uh, Khurasan, this is Khurasan. This is their uh, local um, network there, and they are quite mightful. And I think the Taliban are caught in this, um, really, in this fight to present themselves as some kind of new uh, Taliban, uh, renewed, more moderate Taliban to the West to get to keep the money coming to the country because the biggest problem is the economy, obviously, and poverty. And on the other side, to keep all these young people that are frustrated and that are um, kind of ideology by this ISIS and they want even stricter rules, Islamic rules, than they themselves are maybe applying. Um, so they are caught in this, you know, they have to present themselves as radicals to keep their own Afghan youth with them, to not let them join ISIS, the Islamic State, and on the other hand, to keep the West financing their own governmental um, tasks. So this is really the problem that they face right now, I think. Tyson, um, Daniel just mentioned drone warfare, and it seemed to me at least that it's surely no coincidence that the U.S. Navy's Mideast-based Fifth Fleet announced this week that they are launching a new task force with airborne, s sailing, and underwater drones. Would you expect the U.S.? You talk about isolationism, but isn't it like that, that we will see war on terror continue, but just in this remote fashion? I mean, that has been a trend in U.S. military culture for the past 30 years, and the U.S. has always relied heavily on uh, technological capabilities to be much more advanced than any of its uh, possible opponents. That is its, um, its advantage in asymmetric warfare. But there are certain things, frankly, that you cannot do with military force. And that is where the problem lays. I mean, the, the fact that Obama dramatically escalated uh, the use of, of drones during his presidency was critiqued heavily and was seen perhaps as a, somewhat of a political loser, not only in the countries that were targets, Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc., but also in countries like Germany, which were heavily critical of the use of, of drones and how it was um, uh, seen in context of international law. So I do think that this is the direction the U.S. is going to go, but I don't know if it's going to have the political outcomes that the U.S. is going to hope for. You say heavily critiqued, yet the U.S. continues to use drones. It just uh, attacked uh, a car in Afghanistan. Right. Uh, a number of civilians died. Uh, the circumstances are still somewhat unclear. But for a U.S. population that wanted right. the boots on the ground out of Afghanistan, Will there be somewhat more appetite uh, for remote warfare as long as they don't have to see it too clearly? That's the, I think that's the most important point, is that this, the Afghanistan policy of the United States, the war on terror, is really a domestic policy. It's a domestic American policy. And how it makes sense within that calculus, within that prism, is what's going to work. To the extent that it is remote, to the extent that it's clinical, that it's sanitized, um, it will be much more acceptable to the American public, especially if they're not confronted with it on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis with the lives of their youth. And it's better than regime change. I mean, to be honest, I mean, everybody will be more happy that the Americans do not repeat Iraq because they went to Iraq without any connection to terror in the first place. I mean, we have to maybe... Uh, 
clear this up again, that the war on terror was really not uh, led in Iraq. It was said that it was about terrorism, but in fact there was no link whatsoever between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. So they went there. In the end, the Americans brought Al-Qaeda to Iraq by their occupation, because really Iraq became the hotspot of international jihadism. So this was, uh, and this is one of the reasons is, why it created more terror. Yeah, in the which end. is one of the reasons you also have written recently that uh, the war on terror destabilized the entire region of the Middle East. Drone warfare. No destabilizing uh, consequences there? Civilians killed? Obviously, obviously Absolutely. there are. Yes, I mean, obviously it's, uh, and you just mentioned it, you know, on an um, international law level, it's not even uh, really d debated, you know, until now. So there is a big problem about this. But we are used to the Americans going somewhere, you know, changing regimes, staying there, making a lot of mistakes, bringing more terrorists there. So from a European perspective, a warfare, this remote kind of warfare would be more acceptable, I think. I see, I see a, far, a far bigger uh, problem here. Um, for a long time, Western powers, in particular the US, thought that they have an exclusive, somehow felt exclusive right on the use of these extrajudicial means because they have the moral superiority and they have the, the procedure that every strike, though it's debatable if, if it's legal, but there is a certain procedure, there are certain checks and balances. Many countries in the world are emulating this, this uh, without having the necessary procedures Probably. Armenian, but they're, Azerbaijan. But they're okay. emulating the exact same thing. Yeah. Drone strikes, well, the drone strike, dr use of drone warfare is one thing, but, but using them to strike political opponents across their, their own borders, interfere in, 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 in regional conflicts, extrajudicial judicial, uh, renditions, which basically means kidnappings of political opponents, people they consider a threat to the national security. And a threat to the national security can mean many things. President Erdogan has recently uh, called one of his political opponents in parliament, a representative of the, the most ancient party of the Turkish Republic, a terrorist. Like the use of the word terrorism has been so inflationary and the references to the fight against terror have become really inflationary in a way. And that is, that is a problem uh, for the Western world because it has lost the illusion of this moral superiority and maybe the countries that we're dealing with never thought that the West had an exclusive right on this. It was just like a question of when would they acquire these means. And Russia and China and many small countries in the, in, in, in the Middle East uh, are, are using the same. Iran. So escalation and uh, essentially the creation of precedents for uh, the use of or the abuse of uh, remote some in the region yeah. would even say democratization of these means because why would the yeah well, like I'm, I'm saying this without without being cynical why would the U.S. have an exclusive on this kinds of extrajudicial uh, operations outside their own territory? But I mean this is, is, yeah, yeah, but this is a result of our own foreign policy and even internal policy that we all put under this big headline of war on terror. You know by fighting war on terror, we um, recalibrated our own foreign relations, you know, with the whole Mediterranean area, for example. We went to all these capitals and talked about our common war on terror in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia, in Turkey. So we talked to these people, everybody committed himself to the war on terror and everybody was thinking about his own personal terrorists. So it's bloggers, it's opposition, it's Muslim Brotherhood, yeah. it's PKK. They are all the terrorists that these... Uh, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I want to come to this uh, 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 a little bit later, but I would would like to pick up on one more uh, point uh, before we take a look at uh, some of the other places where, in fact, we are waging the so-called war on terror. And Tyson, the point is this. You, as an American in Europe, you will undoubtedly remember on September 11th, uh, 2001, the profound professions of solidarity from many, many Europeans. Uh, it looked at that time like uh, a truly collective uh, sense of outrage. Um, where did that go? Where are we now? Would you say that there is uh, essentially now a great sense of disillusionment here in Europe? How would you, how do you uh, perceive it? I mean, it was an, an astounding moment. It was a unique moment in history where not only in the United States did you have 70 plus percent approval rating for the Bush uh, government, a rally around the flag, but you had a world community that came together in unlimited solidarity, as uh, the then uh, chancellor said. Um, but it was about the means in which it was uh, pursued, because they, we had the Bond Summit, we had uh, a, a wide coalition of people supporting the idea of war and terror, which was instrumentalized and weaponized by authoritarian states like Russia and China. But still, you had this commitment to the idea. And what happened after 
afterwards, of course, is that it became the uh, instrument of domestic politics in the United States. You had a, a scared population that wanted to see action wherever were possible, and an administration in, in the U.S. that muddled Afghanistan, that talk didn't really say what the... They said the mission is to uh, make sure that al-Qaeda is destroyed and doesn't have a safe haven. Done very quickly. Um, and then changed the objectives in Afghanistan and then moved to, to the Middle Bring East. Bring us up to today, because we're a, a, of course. a little short on time. How, what's your perception of how Europeans see the U.S. today in the wake of this shambolic withdrawal from Afghanistan? I think that they will have a deep reticence to follow the United States into similar missions in the future. But I also think that the U.S. will have the same reticence to engage in those kind of missions. I also think that the idea of the war on terror in Europe is, is a bankrupt concept. It continues to be instrumentalized in places like Syria and China, but it's not being used in Europe. Certainly that sense of disappointment is prompting a lot more calls here in Europe for a more forceful and autonomous European security pillar. But the fact is, the record is mixed when it comes to the success of European anti-terror missions to date. At the moment, the German military is engaged in no less than 10 operations on three continents, one of the most dangerous of them in the West African Sahel. A German military patrol in eastern Mali. They talk to shepherds in the area and try to gain their trust and obtain specific intelligence on planned rebel attacks. After a military coup in 2012, northern Mali temporarily fell under the control of Islamist and other rebel groups. The international community responded by sending the MINUSMA UN forces. Around 900 German troops are taking part. Another 300 German soldiers are part of an EU military training mission to get Mali's own troops in shape to go up against terrorists and criminal gangs. But Mali's armed forces have had to deal with widespread corruption and two putsches in the space of a single year. All the while, the Islamists have been launching new attacks and gaining more ground. Even so, the German Bundestag has extended the German Armed Forces' commitment in Mali for a few more months. Will Mali turn into the next Afghanistan? And Kristen, let me put that question straight to you. Uh, as uh, was the case in Afghanistan, Germany has been concentrating a great deal of its effort on training forces in Mali. Is that more, any more likely to work there than it did in Afghanistan? Well, it's, there are quite some astonishing parallels. First of all, I think, as in Afghanistan, we followed the Americans there. Now we are following the French, because the French are really the main driving force in the Sahel zone and especially in Mali. So we are not in the position to criticize this mission, but we are not putting our own strategic analysis into this. So we are just following, we are paying, we are sending some troops to show that, yes, Germany is ready to take over some foreign policy responsibility, even with troops, which is from a German perspective very special, because we always kind we like to build schools and stuff like that, soft power more than hard power. But the problem is that the same mistakes are being repeated because, again, we are looking for a local government as an ally that is very weak, that is not perceived as legitimate by a lot of the population. And, for example, the French are cooperating with militias that, in the end, create more terrorism because local population feels attacked and feels um, uh, um, put into this uh, war on terror framing that is not really... Um, that's not the reality on the ground. So misunderstanding of the cultural and local conditions again. Daniel, by far the largest player in the Sahel uh, in terms of the military operation there is France. It is now reducing its operation, but says it does intend to stay the course, a lot like the rhetoric we used to hear from the U.S. What would be your advice to President Macron or his successor? I strictly don't give any advice to any political leader <clears throat> because I think MENA, Middle East experts, anthropologists or whatever might be good at analyzing the situation but not necessarily at giving the right policy advice at the right moment because there is a political game going on that is sometimes far beyond the expert scope. I think the French are going to stay in the Sahel and they're going to get, stay, remain engaged in the Sahel zone because this region pertains to some fundamental French interest and the French have been there for a long time. And so they feel a certain responsibility and also uh, have defined their interest. Uh, natural resources, security, migration, stabilizing the Sahel is, of course, uh, important for the French. And they have their own way of, of, of looking at things. I don't think and President Macron is going, to, is going to withdraw from this. Then My advice for everyone who's dealing with, 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 with these issues is to try to look through the other person's eyes. 
I'm not, I'm not advocating for talking and negotiating with terrorist organizations all across the globe, but I think it is fundamentally important to try to understand what is the motivation and what is the reason why someone is picking up arms, because that helps you a lot to deal with this enemy or probably to turn this enemy into an ally if necessary. Let me give the last word to Tyson. Uh, Tyson, our title asks whether 20 years later, where we, whether we can now say the war on terror was a lost cause. What's your answer to that? Um, I, I think that it is, yes, I think it's, it's pretty, I mean, to be quite honest, it, this has been a huge investment in treasure and time and resources, and I don't think that we have the outcome that was anticipated in those first years. And Daniel doesn't want to advise President Macron. What would you say to Macron? I would say, uh, from the U.S. perspective, look at things through other people's eyes, but, you know, the U.S. sees Europe is the underwriter of this region, and this is the, the future that we have, which is much more uh, great powers like Europe, like Russia, like the United States, taking responsibility in their own neighborhoods. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being with us, and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon.